Assalamu alaikum to our beloved viewers. Shukran for tuning in week after week and making us a part of your home. Tahir Khan is a Johannesburg-based entrepreneur whose business looks at sustainable energy solutions. At its heart, however, are the Islamic values and principles that he grew up with that continues to guide him. Being an entrepreneur is not an easy path to follow. Quite often there are more downs than ups, but the ability to work for what you truly believe in comes with a certain satisfaction. And for Tahir Khan, it is not only about being a business person, but also about bringing solutions to an ever-changing world. When I was in third year of university, I had applied to Sasol for a bursary and you know you were committed to them for the number of years that you had the bursary for. So in that way I had started electrical engineering at FITS and then I was almost at that time due to commence work at the Sasol plant in Sasselburg. So that's how I got into the, the Sasol and um, it, was, it was almost an immediate entry into the work experience, you know, where you get included into all major electrical engineering experience and projects. So it was really good. Tahir is passionate about the prospects around renewable energy. He got a taste for it when he was part of a two-year graduate program at ESCOM. This ignited a spark that would eventually end up with him starting his own business in the field. I think a lot of that experience also comes from having worked in fairly small development teams after leaving a large corporate like Sasol. You know, you, you see that you have limited budget, you need to be a lot more entrepreneurial. You can't uh, overcapitalize on overheads. And I think that because of the economy that we're in, you know, you have to be quite specific in how you manage those costs. So I think a lot of that thinking from the, the companies that I was at uh, before starting my own venture influenced a lot of the lessons that I incorporated into this. One of the great successes of the graduate program was meeting Anthony Mpati, who'd go on to become his mentor. They've stayed in touch over the years, and with Anthony's guidance, Tahir was able to navigate the world of renewable energy a little easier. I met Mohammed back in 2007. We were still both working for Sasol, uh, in Sasolberg in particular. I was uh, two years his senior at the time, and uh, they allocated him to my department to basically assist him with his graduate development program. So he's very curious, um, he, you know, inquisitive. He asked a lot of questions. So I convinced him to eventually jump ship. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I've been playing like a mentorship role to him, you know, um, assisting him and also providing certain opportunities uh, to him whenever they arise. Anthony and I go back many years, you know, back to when we were working at Cecil and he was two years my senior. And I think we really got along well. I could see that he was someone that on a personal basis, um, he, someone that I could identify with. And then when he decided to leave Cecil and when I caught up with him a few years later, I could see that you know, he had taken that entrepreneurial jump, uh, went off on his own, started doing some really good things in the industry, in the electrical contracting industry. For me, it was an obvious choice when I wanted to get advice um, on, on the same entrepreneurial journey myself. So it's been a fruitful, uh, value-adding contribution to both of us. And um, I, I look forward to it continuing into the future. Being able to bounce ideas off each other has paid dividends for both men. More and more they are looking at ventures where they can partner up and bring their collective skill and experience to projects they believe in. I think when it comes to business, especially being an entrepreneur, there is no set book that you can follow. You know, it's not like there's a rule book in play that you can just follow the way that you would when it comes to doing straightforward engineering you know when it comes to the technical and the engineering side of things you know there there's a calculated approach you know how to do a calculation you know how to size a system and that's it but when you in the business world there's so many more variables there's so many more uncertainties you know just having someone available to bounce off ideas to be able to discuss something and then they tell you from experience oh, maybe consider this consider that I think it just broadens your overall view of things and uh, that that's really a, the key reason why a mentor would be important 
Tahir's role in the business has been to find new work and they are managing to grow at a speedy pace. There are challenges, but having a solution-focused person has stood them in good stead. So I think the role that we as Zero Coin Energy can play is uh, educating the public to make them understand and see the value in renewable energy and uh, looking at the alternatives. So we can play that space in providing affordable electricity to the public and the private sector and uh, doing it in a way that makes sense in terms of a financial return on investment to them as an environmentally friendly solution to the environment and to the world at large. And at the same time, uh, taking off that burden on the ESCOM network and the, ES and the national grid. Having grown up in a family that places a high value on religion means that Islam has been an integral part of shaping the person he was to become. Tahir took two years of work and studies to concentrate on empowering himself with more knowledge of the deen. I think Islam it plays a fundamental role. You know, that it encompasses all spheres of my life. I'd like to think that, you know, whatever I do at home or at work, in my personal or professional life, uh, you know, religion and Islam, the, the rules, the etiquette of Islam filter through in everything that I do. Islam places a high value on a morally aware individual, and this in turn influences how someone conducts themselves. Tahir Khan is proving to be a person whose grounding has enabled him to be an exemplary Muslim that others can look up to and emulate. The history of Islam in this country is both fascinating and interesting. There are many pioneers who braved difficult conditions but persevered and as such laid the foundation for the religion in far-flung places. This week we explore the history of Islam in Port Shepston on the KwaZulu-Natal south coast. The spread of Islam in South Africa has only been possible through the efforts of some pioneering individuals and families. They brave the elements as they set out to far off places and persevered under some trying conditions. Port Shepston, a town on the KwaZulu south coast, became significant after the discovery of marble. Soon thereafter, a group of European immigrants came here and established a little town. Years later, they were followed by the first Muslims who ventured from Durban to lay down roots in what was then a backwater town. Well, my family's history goes back into the 1890s. That was when my great-grandfather came to uh, South Africa from India. He came with his wife and uh, they went to Ladysmith. And uh, that's where my father was born. And uh, then my grandfather bought a sugarcane plantation, but I suppose he didn't like it in South Africa. So the whole family went back to India. And then when my father was 13 years old, my uh, great grandfather decided to send him back. And uh, he came not knowing any English and he taught himself uh, how to read and write English. Uh, he told us that uh, he first started his business with um, a f close friend, but that didn't seem to work, and uh, he decided to open up his own business. Muslims settled in and around the central business district where they opened up shops and, most importantly, a mosque. Auntie Rukaya's late dad was an instrumental member of the Port Shepston Muslim community and donated both land for a school and raised money to build the first mosque. My father started his own business and as far as the masjid is concerned, he had another good friend who was Mr. Gulam Hussein Peer and they went as far as Cape Town to do collections. Uh, among uh, friends and family who were there, Muslims of course. And then when he came back, he got his crew together and uh, they started building the masjid. And that's the masjid that's standing there today. A few prominent families became the anchor and they set about stitching together the first threads of what was to become a prosperous Muslim community. Uh, in the day that I grew up in Port Shepston, there was no distinction. There was no distinguishing between who a Muslim was or who anybody else was. Everybody lived together. 
We loved the people who we lived with. We loved the Hindus. We grew up together. And um, I even recall that we used to send, even when whatever we cooked, we used to send little trays and little bowls of food to our neighbors who were non-Muslims at that time. And it was a wonderful time. We grew up together. We were friends. We went to school. And our parents were friends as well. As the area grew, so too did the Muslim community. Apartheid played its role as well when Muslims were forced out of the central business area and relocated to the suburb of Albusville. Here, they opened another mosque and school to see to the needs of their faith and children. The Pochepsen Islamic School is an independent school. It started here in 1994. Uh, it was built by the community and uh, it serves this community uh, where we have a formal curriculum, the CAPS curriculum, uh, and it's permeated by an Islamic ethos. The school prides itself in being a space for all. Its Islamic ethos are not only entrenched, but put into practice for all to participate in. Well, we've got to go back to the concept of the Islamic school. We had schools that started around the mid-90s because the Muslim community felt that there was something missing. We needed to produce leaders, especially Muslim leaders. We needed to bring more of the Quran, the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala into our lives. And we also need to bring about a change in our character by focusing on the footsteps of our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Given that, the curriculum need to be changed from just a formal curriculum to a curriculum which catered for spiritual needs of children. So here, you are preparing your child for the here and the hereafter. The backbone of any community are most often the women who tirelessly contribute in any way they can. In Port Shepston, they have a name, Sisters for Humanity. Sisters for Humanity is a non-profit organization that was founded by Sister Hasina Katrada. The organization uh, initially started in her personal capacity as she realized that there was a need to work amongst the poor and the needy and the socially distressed people. And then a few years later, she was climbing Mount Kilimanjaro on a charitable drive and the idea of formalizing this organization took seed. And thus the name Sisters for Humanity was born on the slopes of Mount Kilimanjaro. Fatima and her team of women are well known in the communities in and around Port Shepston. They can often be found rolling up their sleeves and working for the upliftment of all the city's residents. The project, firstly, there's the Princess Project. We call it the Princess Project because the lady involved there, her name is Princess. Princess was disabled during a shootout between the ANC and IFP factions. We got together as, a, as sisters. We engaged with our local community, our local businesses. This little house of hers, we refurbished it simply, but just so that it would be comfortable for her and that it would restore some of her dignity and make her happy. Potchepston is a small town with a very big heart. And this is something as Sisters for Humanity that we've realized. We've never been turned away. There's all, there are always people, business people, family members, community members, who will always come to our assistance because they believe in us and they believe in our projects and because they have big hearts and they do want to help. Islam is a religion that encourages its followers to continuously live by example. Muslims are encouraged to become part of the fabric of society and by in so doing benefit not only themselves but the religion as well. Those early pioneers lived through some trying conditions but the seeds they planted have grown into a compassionate community of Muslims. The excitement of Eid is in the air as we slowly bid farewell to the final few days of Ramadan. It truly has been a poignant time in the lives of Muslims the world over as we continue to adhere to COVID-19 protocols. Lamise de Toy has one of the Cape's most famous Eid dishes on standby, so get your pens and papers out if you want to learn how to make the best crayfish curry this Eid. Assalamu alaikum. 
it's very rare that you'd go to a Cape Tonian's house on E-Day and not find crayfish curry as one of the main dishes. And today I'm going to share the crayfish curry the way my grandmother used to make it, old school style. And the ingredients that you need are the following. So I've got about four medium sized onions, finely chopped. I've got the crayfish tails. And then what I've also got is the legs. This is my favorite part of the crayfish and they add so much flavor. Tomato puree, I don't add tomatoes to mine. I've got oil for frying, and then obviously this beautiful plate of greenery is my green chilies. Curry leaves that add a flavor that you just don't get from any of your dry spices. Fresh coriander, which will only add diet at the end. And yes, this looks really gross, but I promise you, this is what my grandmother said was the krach in the curry. It's the crayfish innards, and it is absolutely delicioso in the curry, but not so pretty to look at. And then the spices that I'm using for this curry are the following. I have about three heaped teaspoons of fennel, two heaped teaspoons of cumin or jeera, I've got two heaped teaspoons of turmeric. I've got three heaped teaspoons of chili powder. And then I've got ground coriander, another three teaspoons, as well as three teaspoons of garam masala. And then I've got tomato paste. Of course, we've got the sugar that counters that sourness. Salt to taste, a little bit of ginger, and that's about a, a two inch piece grated. And I've got about four cloves of garlic crushed. So I'm gonna start off by heating my pan. So I don't like to add the whole spices to my crayfish curry, although this is something my grandmother would have said you have to have, especially the cinnamon. And the reason why I don't add it now is because I like to fry off all my ingredients, blend my sauce, and I add the cinnamon sticks at the end just to add that extra sweetness. So in goes a good amount of oil because I want to caramelize my onions until they're really, really sweet. Into this goes my onions. So it looks like quite a bit right now, but remember your onions almost cook away, they dissolve, so to speak. And to that, I'm just gonna add a pinch of salt just to help it along. And with that, some green chilies that I'm just gonna slice down the middle and pop into my pan. It's just such a good flavor that you get from chili. Even if you de-seed it, I promise you, you will taste the difference. And then every crayfish curry needs to have fresh curry leaves. So I add them in by just pulling things off the stalk. Don't use the dry version. It's not the same. So this is basically the slow part of the crayfish curry, is getting all of this to cook down until my onions are nicely caramelized, golden brown, and half the volume. And once it gets to this point when it's released all its sugars and it starts to caramelize, that's when we start to roast our spices. So now I'm going to add my fennel. And I like the sweetness that fennel brings to a curry. My cumin or jeera, turmeric, which is a natural antiseptic and also helps to thicken the sauce. Chili powder, because what is a curry without chili? And bear in mind, I've added some green chilies as well. And chili powder, you can put in as much or as little as you like. This is freshly ground coriander seeds and then some garam masala. And you can smell the difference that that makes. And all that a curry needs is just some love. And when I get to the point where I feel like I need to either sneeze or cough, that's when I add my tomato puree. And this is just one tin, which I think is more than enough. Our garlic and ginger, tomato paste, and a little bit of water, and then I'm just gonna let this cook subtly for like five minutes before I blend it. Ginger, and the tomato paste. Now there's no salt added to this yet. I'm just gonna add a little bit of water, and I'm just gonna allow these flavors to cook for about five minutes and intensify before I blend. So now that this has been gently simmering away, I'm going to season with salt and just a hint of sugar. And then for sugar, I would say about a teaspoon to two teaspoons of sugar, but it shouldn't be sweet. It just needs to take that edge off of the tomato, because remember we've used tomato puree, 
as well as tomato paste. So what I'm going to get now is an immersion blender just to blend the sauce and everybody gets a bit of everything. And now we're going to add the awful, awful business, which is the clearfish in it. But I promise you, it adds so much flavor to the curry. So I'm adding this, and I'm going to make sure this gets blended into my sauce. And then the legs that you only used to get in the clay fish of yesterday because these days people only make it with the legs. So I make sure everything gets a little bit of sauce. I'm gonna pop the lid on this will literally eat. Basically, once the shells turn the blind orange, you know that your crayfish is cooked. Very similarly with prawns. So this has been gently simmering for about five minutes, which means it's nearly ready. I'm just going to chop up some fresh coriander's garnish. Ooh. And there you have it. Every Cape Townian's favorite delicious crayfish curry. So until I see you next time, have a blessed week. Assalamu alaikum everyone, Eid Mubarak. Absolutely delicious that looked. I think I'm getting myself some crayfish right now and will try my hand in making this yummy meal. Eid Mubarak from myself and the team. Kinamare Mokwanda, Kiri Aribueri Bonanangabe. Assalamu alaikum.